Ever wonder what GM does with all the great historic and concept vehicles it's produced over the years? Well, we'll learn the answer as we get a rare look inside the GM Specialty Vehicles Collections, home to hundreds of legendary cars like the turbine-powered Firebird 3, 1959's Car of the Future, the stunning 1951 LeSabre, the mid-engine Aerovet, the insane 700 horsepower Tiger Shark, the voice-activated Buick LaCrosse, and many more. So join me, Dennis Gage, for an amazing hour of GM automotive history and future. Well, Dennis, you found the place okay, I see. <laughs> Your directions were good. It took me a little while, but, but I found it, and, and wow. What do, you, what do you think, Dennis? What do you think? Fabulous. How many cars do you have here? This is only a fraction. This is only like 150 out of our possible 750 vehicles we've got. Well, you've got such wild stuff, concepts and, and, and classics and historics and stuff. I, I'd like to see it all. I don't know how to do it, though. Well, Dennis, you know, I realize you got a, a, just a short amount of time that we can do this in, but I've handpicked uh, just a few of the various categories that we build and or control or house here. So you're going to see the best of the best of the GM collection. What are we waiting for? Oh, let's, let's go. go. Let's go. <laughs> John Moss is known as the king of performance at GM. At the time of my visit, he was the manager of GM's specialty vehicles collections. This unique group of cars and people is part of GM's performance division and is charged with collecting, preserving, and promoting GM's rich production and concept car history. And what's, the, what's this? This is just a... Uh, oh, this is a very interesting car. Let me explain to you what we're doing. As you know, we're trying to... As a manufacturer, we're trying to bust into that uh, tuner market, right, okay? Right. Well, this is Sunfire that is going into production. Now, this is an O2 Sunfire with, you know, a new hood, fascias, rockers, uh, rear spoiler, rear fascia. Are you going to be able to order it this way, with, like, like even the trick headlights? You're going to be able to order all these components wow. through the service parts organization and upfit your own uh, say used uh, Sunfire. Now this is really wild too. Yeah, this is the new Cheyenne. Man, now, is, I mean, is that, that going to be a production vehicle? This is a kind With of those a, lines? This is a kind of a, what you want to call a sneak peek into the future of Man. the of the new uh, full-size uh, pickup. Of course, this, this Oldsmobile is a, another yes. beautiful car. And you, again, remember how we were talking about Olds and Buick with their white interiors? Mm -hmm. Both both of those two uh, divisions uh, really did the, the the real neat interiors with the white and uh, and uh, you know, the two toning uh, yeah. of the interior. But I, I love the bangle here. This is this is a it's another great Buick concept. They just have such great concept cars always have they, they've they've really done a very nice job and of course the the Bengal came after the lacrosse that was uh -huh. the next year and uh, when you look at it it's got similar thoughts from the lacrosse carrying into this vehicle and you know the the portholes they were a little bit different but they you still got the portholes the single uh, arm wiper you know uh, open air top this was more of the kind of the roadster appearance that they were I going like to how do. the lines cross you got this Mm -hmm. fender line and the rear one and they actually cross at the door. I mean, this is some great styling. Oh, it's a beautiful, beautiful car. GM's collection of historic vehicles isn't the world's largest, but it's full of rare and original pieces. For example, this 1905 Buick Model C is the fourth oldest Buick on the planet. Only 14 of these automobiles are known to exist of the 750 cars that were produced. And GM is still actively collecting their own history. This beautiful 1939 Buick Roadmaster Model 81C Phaeton was purchased in 1999. Only 311 were built, and they sold for $1,983. Power is provided by 120 horsepower straight eight. This is also the first car that came with turn signals as standard equipment. The first car John picked is very representative of the unique, original vehicles that GM has in their collection. This 1932 Oldsmobile five-window sport coupe was a stunning automobile in its day, with white wall tires, extending wood wheels, and contrasting body colors. The sport coupe was a three-passenger car and featured chrome front and rear bumpers, tall vertical grille and surround shell, headlamps, fender-mounted marking lamps, and a spotlight. This extremely rare model originally sold for $970. John, this is absolutely beautiful. Well, Dennis, this is my personal favorite of the collection. Let me tell you, this you is have a good very, taste. Oh, yeah, it's a very, very fabulous car. We are very pleased to have this in our collection. So it is such a rare car. In fact, I've, 
as far as I know, it could be the only one in existence. And it's a five-window coupe, and that's really the rare piece of it, right? Yeah, because normally you saw the 32 Olds in a, in a sedan, a four-door, and, and to have a five-window coupe is, is a very rare piece. Well, it's really ornate. This must have been a, a high-end model, even in its day. This was, if, if you had a few bucks, you know, uh, this is the car you had, because if you look at the ornateness, uh, this is the car you would take to the country club, more the single man's car, the suitor's car, he would take it to the country club. In fact, there's a door back here for your for golf clubs club, to right? take to the country club. So yes, this was the car. It was kind of the sports car. Sports car. You could almost uh, equate this now to the, the modern Corvette. Uh, this was the, the sports car of that era. So you had arrived if you had this you car. You have arrived, let me tell you. <laughs> It's a lot of great chrome on this, which you, you didn't see that much in that era. And fabulous pinstriping and other details. I love the wheels. The wheels, uh, that was, a, was a very interesting on that because that is really the design right off the art, old artillery carriage, or the cannon carriages of, of the day. So that's a very, very uh, unique piece. And that ornate painting and all that would have gone with this? Well, if you look at this, this is with the chroming and the, uh, and the pinstriping, the two-toning, uh, a very, very elegant touch. It's a lot like the current uh, hot rod, uh, hot rodders of today would yeah. do. Well, and a lot of other details. I mean, I love the crank. It's a crank down back window, isn't crank it? Crank down back window because if you had the passenger in the rumble seat, okay. the crank down the window, he could talk to the people in the front. And if you didn't, you had a nice little window shade. You had a window, window shade to keep him out. <laughs> well, this would have been this would have been the one to take to the course. Oh, this is a very, very, uh, very nice car. Yes. The next vehicle shows the origin of the sport utility vehicle. The 1936 Chevrolet Suburban Carryall was designed to carry people in a truck type vehicle, but in a comfortable manner. And with options like white wall tires, a radio and heater, the carryall was very civilized while still being a hunter's dream. To this day, the Suburban line of Chevrolet trucks remains the ultimate super duty station wagon truck. And for about the amount of an average payment on a new Suburban, $685, you could have paid in full for this one. Well, now, John, this is a pretty historically significant vehicle here. This is really one of the first SUVs, right? Well, it's, yes, it's, it's not quite the first one because <laughs> 1935 is when the, when the uh, Chevy Suburban uh, first got started. This is a 1936, and quite frankly, very fortunate to have one. As you've been watching television, this is appearing in a lot of the uh, current uh, suburban commercials. You see the little horse farm, and uh, but this has been used quite extensively in a lot of commercials. Well, it's in beautiful shape, and most of these, you know, didn't survive. They were utility vehicles. Well, yes, uh, when they were used basically in agricultural areas, you know, the, and the most of them we would see with the the panel delivery van, which was most of them. We're very rare to find one with seats, which really emulates our current suburban. Yeah, and it's. It, it's a Chevy, it was a utilitarian vehicle, but it's still really beautifully appointed. Well, for Chevrolet, especially back in that era, you see it's a, it's a three-tone black and, and the cream color with a kind of the taupe color, but you notice even the pinstriping, mm -hmm. pinstriping on the Chevrolet way back then. It was, it's very, very unique. So what powered this? Well, we have a, this traditional straight six, but overhead valve straight six, not the old flat uh, flathead, and uh, 74 horsepower with a synchromesh three-speed. Amazing. And also, it was very popularly priced. Yes, uh, out the door, $685. So today I could take it out the door for $685? Not, not today, today. not today. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's beautiful and it really is a, a great historic piece for the collection. Oh, it's a great, great, we're just very fortunate to have it. The next car John brought out is one of my all-time favorites. The 1953 Buick Skylark Anniversary Convertible celebrated 50 years of Buick production. The Skylark was based on a custom factory-built Roadmaster body that was sectioned, chopped, and featured a special wraparound windshield. Buick's new pentaroof chamber overhead valve V8 was unique to the industry. Stunning and fresh in its appearance even today, only 1,690 were built in 1953, with a list price of about $5,000 each. Well, you know, John, the 32 Olds may be your favorite, but this is one of mine. <laughs> well, this is a really nice car, <laughs> it, it sure is, and it, it's, it's truly fabulous. Now, 53 was a big year. Well, yes, Dennis, and you mentioned fabulous. This was a part, or one of the cars, of the famous Fab the Four. Fab you know? Four. Fab Four, which was the, you know, made up comprised of the 53 uh, Corvette, the 53 El Dorado convertible, and the 53 Olds uh, Fiesta convertible. And then the 53, 53 Skylark. Skylark. Now this was a, a very limited production run too, right? Yes, we only made seven, less than 1,700 of these uh, vehicles and what's very unique about this, you know, we talk about our custom shops, our modern customizing uh, shops today, but here is a factory customized shop. And when I say that, this car was chopped and it was sectioned to from a uh, production Roadmaster right out of the assembly line. That's right, I mean, this really wasn't 
they made this car from another car, and, and, and you look at the windshield, and it's just, it's very narrow. You can see it's chopped, and it's raked at a nice angle, too. Raked, and not only that, but look at the, look at the curvature. This is one of the first usages of a curved or wraparound, as it, it was termed, uh, windshield. In, in, the, in the 53 Skylight? Yes. It was also uh, first time for the engine. Well, yes, this, uh, you've heard the term nail head. Uh, you know, this was derived from this overhead valve uh, 322 cubic inch V8 motor. And as you notice, most of the engines and most engines today, you know, the valve covers are on an angle. Mm -hmm. Well, if you look at these uh, valve covers, they're vertical, they're straight up and down. And that's exactly the way the, the valves were. They were vertical. So uh, you know, look at uh, underneath the valve cover, they're all in a line. So it looks like nails down nail, That's where that term head, comes from. Yes. Well, Kelsey Hayes wheels, another uh, feature was it had the Dynaflow Dyna Flow trans trans Dyna transmission. Dyna transmission. That's correct. Well, these things were just, they were fabulous. They looked great in their day, and they still look good today. You could cruise down the street in this and just get looks like. Well, this would definitely stop traffic, I'll tell you that. Maybe we could go stop some traffic. Do you well, think we could actually take this baby out? I think, Dennis, you've been really great. Let's, <laughs> let's go. Let's take this thing for a ride. Let's Dynaflow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you said you've never driven one. I so haven't. This here, is, here is your absolute chance to drive a 53 uh, Buick Skylark. I, well, what, what, what are we waiting for? Well, let's let's get it going. All right. Let's see. It's the floor starter too, right? Here we go. Here we are. Buick oh. <laughs> V8 power. Look, oh, no hands. <laughs> right. Dynaflow. Here we go. I'm amazed how, uh, how smooth the power steering is on this. The power steering is very smooth, and uh, you know we were talking about the uh, Dynaflow transmission. You know, it, this is really, really, really a smooth transmission. Oh, it is. Yeah, it's just very, very smooth. Well, I expect with, uh, with a wheel this size, I expect it to be, you know, muscling a little bit more. Well, the big thing is, you know, the turning rate. You know, the the ratio of the steering is is quite large. It doesn't wander really either. This, you know, for a '50s car. It, uh, it tracks pretty nice. Yes, it does. And, uh, you know, the, it's very it's very, uh, very stable, you know, and uh, even for a car that size, of course, you know, Buicks were notorious for being very, very heavy. Oh, and you, and can, so, you can feel it. It's you're heavy. right. It's a very heavy, solid car. And what did you say? There were 1,600 some of these made? Yeah, 1,690 of them made, you know, and, uh, and what's really unique is to have a factory custom car come out of, off the assembly line. You know, that's almost unheard of in today's standard. Now, a guy like you kind of sticks up over this windshield, John. Yes, I was going to say, I'm getting a, 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 a hand burner. <laughs> it's, it is really chopped down, but it's a low sh windshield. Yeah, it's about three inch chop on this uh, on this windshield, which really is uh, unique for e even doing things in those days, you know? Yeah. And when you consider, you know, all the interior room these old cars had versus what we have today, uh, you know, they, they really did think of the people, I'll tell you. As you can see, the light rain kept us from really enjoying this gorgeous car, so we decided to head back a little early to preserve this gem for generations to come. GM builds quite a few so-called production-based concepts. A production-based concept is a styling and or engineering exercise based on a car or truck that is currently in production. These vehicles allow GM to cost-effectively test new concepts and ideas, many of which will make it into production a year or two later. A perfect example of this is the 1992 Chevrolet Impala SS, the original pre-production prototype mule car that led to the 1994 Impala SS production car. Today, the car appears in slightly modified form. A couple years ago, John and his staff did their magic and took the car one step further by adding a massive 510 cubic inch big block that produces 545 horsepower. The result is the ultimate street bruiser and cruiser. A return of Chevy factory support to the NHRA and the arrival of the LS1 V8 in the Camaro in the late 90s provided the inspiration for this Camaro drag car production concept. The idea was simple. Find out how much performance potential lies hidden in an off-the-shelf Z28. The answer turned out to be 580 horsepower from the LS1. This dramatic Chevy Highlander show truck, built in 1994, is based on an extended cab S10 pickup with some extras. The Highlander features an adjustable roll bar. 
When the roll bar is in its up position, an automatic fabric top rolls out over the bar and can cover the bed and side areas. It also has a power rear window that when in the down position, the bottom half can be folded flat, allowing movement between the cab and pickup bed. The Chevrolet Silverado SST is a perfect example of how GM uses a production-based concept to experiment with different combinations of production vehicles and parts. For this exercise, GM shortened the wheelbase to 133 inches, added several carbon fiber body panels, as well as a trick hood. Well, John, this is one trick truck. <laughs> <laughs> this is what you call your full customized truck. <laughs> yes, it is. Now, this is what you refer to as a production concept, right? What is that? Well, let me explain that to you. We hear the, the term concepts, and, and a lot of the term concepts get confused with like the big theme concepts you'd see at the major auto shows. What we refer, refer to this as a production concept is this is where we take a, a production vehicle that's currently in production. In this case, a Silverado. A Silverado. And then we modify it to wherever our, the division or the, or the marketing uh, brands want this to go, take a, give it a certain message to. So it's both an engineering exercise and kind of a marketing exercise. Well, yes, because when we were looking at this, uh, you know, Chevrolet strategy was, like, was looking at, let's, what is, we'd like to bring back this SS uh, moniker that was so popular oh, yeah. in, the, in, the, in the 60s. And so what we did was uh, we developed a truck with G uh, GM styling on how to bring back that SS cues in, in, in a truck. So it's killer looking. What all did you do to it? Well, when this, this thing is really from bumper to bumper, quite frankly. You know, when you look at the powertrain, it's got a very unique powertrain. We have a, it's basically based off the uh, C5 Corvette. You know, it's got a heavily modified LS6 uh, uh, motor and then full independent rear suspension with a transmission six speed in the rear. And what kind of power in the, in the front? 480 horse. 480 horse. Very just, nice. Just, just a touch. <laughs> just, 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 a touch. A touch. just a touch. Well, you've also, I mean, the body you've done a lot too also. Well, when you look at the body, this is, the, this is what you call the new clean look. If you look at vehicles, uh, customized vehicles, or even production vehicles uh, 40 years ago, they had lots of chrome. You see this vehicle, absence of chrome. You know, very, very slight touches. And uh, you've, you've done some shortening, some... Well, what's very unique about this truck is that we have actually chopped and, and, and really shortened the, the bed and then grafted the bed onto the cab so the, uh, the uh, actual body of the cab and the truck box is all in one piece. It's a very unique look. Beautiful. It's just so sleek and it's, it's down. It's down. It's down. down. Well, it's low. got a full air ride suspension. Oh, it's beautiful and like a rock. Like a rock. Next, John brought out the Oldsmobile Outrage, a concept that definitely lives up to its name. For this stunning number, GM took a 1923 four-door touring car, added a lift-off top, the four-liter Olds Aurora IMSA GTS1 racing power plant, four-wheel independent suspension, and giant tires. They finished off this rad ride with outrageous green paint. Whoa! <laughs> I like this. That's beautiful music. Music. I must say. Now, what's your excuse for this one? <laughs> <laughs> no, this is the this is a modern rendition of a, of a just a pure California custom right it here. It really is. It's gorgeous. Now, what did it start as? It started out as an Olds 23 touring, you know, roadster. Really. So it's a steel body. A steel body, full steel body car. That is, is the proverbial dig it out of the cornfield car. Unbelievable. There's so much interesting styling going on here. This this top and the way that's cut away, it's almost got a 60s look to it. That's right. This top, and by the way, this is a lift off top, not, not a fold down, oh, so nice. like the seven one was, but this is a full lift off top with a lot of modern technology in this well, vehicle. Well, thoroughly modern in the power plant. This is the ultimate of technology. This is the engine we raced in the uh, IMSA GTC, uh, GTS series. And uh, it was a really a takeoff of the motor that we raced in IRL. It's, it's the Aurora engine. It's the Aurora engine, and we're running 500 horsepower in this one. Unbelievable. And then a lot of other modern appointments, the latest and greatest. I mean, I love the reflectors on the bumpers and, 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 and the wood grain on the, uh, uh, the wood uh, running boards. But those tires are huge. <laughs> How about 22s in the back and 18s <laughs> in the front? And look at those um, really, really modern LA uh, custom wire wheels with knockoff hubs. It, it is unbelievable. So this thing just kind of goes around and makes people happy, goes around to shows. And oh yes, it's very been very popular, of course, at the uh, hot rod shows and the typical, you know, roaster events that you see this vehicle at. You just have too much fun. You know, you really do. This is beautiful, John. This is a gorgeous vehicle. The Chevrolet Corvette has had a special place in America's garage for over 50 years. 
deep in the recesses of Chevy's styling and engineering studios, this Corvette concept was conceived and built. From its jaw-dropping tiger yellow paint to its massive seven-liter supercharged V8, this vet says, get out of the way or prepare to be devoured. So John, what was the uh, goal behind this project? To see how much punch you could pack into a Corvette or what? <laughs> well, this is almost like an experimental car. You know, we always continue pushing the envelope. And <clears throat> this is both not only a, a look exercise, but it's also a powertrain exercise as well. And what we were looking at here is to try and develop how much can you move or push the envelope and see what you could put on the street that's Right on the right on the right edge. Right you know, what can you drive and what can't you drive on the street? So, well, with our new components that were coming out of our, our performance parts group, uh, we started with a basic new 427 small block racing block, and uh, we've got the new C5R racing heads, and and we pushed the envelope with a lot of you know really high tech uh, uh, rods, from, you know, the, all the insides of the of the uh, engine, and then we attached a, a Vortex supercharger with an intercooler with about eight and a half pounds of boost and push the horsepower up to about 750 at 6,000 RPM with a really broad band uh, torque range. Now that's that's an aluminum engine, right? All aluminum, everything yeah. is all aluminum. A small block 427? Yes, correct. Now that's with rev limiters on it and everything like right that. Right now we've got a rev limiter and so if you take the rev limiter off, it probably is capable of about 8,500 RPM, which would probably put the horsepower up in the easy neighborhood of about oh, 825 800 horsepower. <laughs> My goodness, and that, that's impressive. Now, exterior-wise, it's equally impressive. The the color is is wild. Yeah, we developed this with PPG. It's a we, we dubbed it Tiger Yellow, and it's a four quote uh, process. Very, very, very unique color. In fact, we've had it at the auto shows, and people say, "Where'd you get that color? Oh, Where'd you get that it's color?" It's beautiful. So uh, they're thinking about making a refinish. Uh, Product. But the hood, this takes me back. I mean, that's the old Stingray hood. That's exactly right. We looked at, you know, what was made the Corvette very distinct back in the 60s uh, and early 70s, you know, and, and this hood is very, quite frankly, just shaped very similar with the, with the moniker of the 427 on it, just like we did in the uh, 20, 30 years ago. <laughs> Got to drive this, John. Oh, we've well. got to drive. Could, 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 could I drive this? Well, Dennis, if you got your pilot's license ready. <laughs> yes, it is. It's up to date. <laughs> is it up to date? Okay. Let's fly. Let's go. I was anxious to see what a 750 horsepower Corvette could do on the open road. It's just too bad we couldn't take it to an open racetrack. <laughs> serious brakes on this oh, baby. Serious. This is uh, one of uh, this manufactured actually by Brembo. It's one of the racing uh, packages right here. Uh, just look at it. Oh, look. I know. And it looks lower. Well, when you see this thing out in the uh, sun, you know, with, this, uh, with, this, with the color, lowered, everything, it's a gorgeous machine. Well, what do you say we fire this baby up? Oh, well, yeah, so take it for a spin. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, mind you, I asked you earlier, do you have your pilot's license? Yeah, I got my pilot's license, okay, trust me. Okay, here we go. It's a five-point harness, I think you need it.
The most glamorous and exciting cars companies produce are their concept cars. They're designed and built from the ground up to test engineering concepts and to dazzle the public with their futuristic styling. Over the years, GM created some of the wildest concept cars ever. The idea for this concept, 1954's Firebird 1, came from the legendary Harley Earl, then VP of Styling at GM. The idea was to test the feasibility of equipping automobiles with gas turbine engines. Of course, Harley added futuristic styling borrowed from jet aircraft of the time. The radical fender design of the 1954 Buick Wildcat II makes it one of the most attractive of the General Motors concept vehicles. The Wildcat II, like the 1953 Wildcat I and the Chevrolet Corvette, reflect GM's interest at the time in developing small, powerful cars with lightweight fiberglass bodies. Though Buick stayed out of the two-seat roadster business until the development of the Riata, elements from this car made it into production years later. Buick enthusiasts will recognize the sweep spear chrome on the 1956 Centurion concept as being similar to the 1957 production Buicks. They might even recognize the rear fins as being like those on the 1959 models. The rest of the car, however, is one of a kind. The 1956 Firebird II concept was unveiled by Harley Earl amid much fanfare. It represented a progress report on the feasibility of gas turbine-powered vehicles. Unlike the original single-seat Firebird I that developed 1,250-degree exhaust temps, the four-seat Firebird II featured a regenerative gas turbine engine that operated nearly 1,000 degrees cooler. Other features included the first use of four-wheel disc brakes, fully independent four-wheel suspension, and a sophisticated electronic guidance system for use on the electronic highway of the future. The 1959 Cadillac Cyclone concept was designed to test new styling and a host of high-tech engineering ideas. The two-passenger automobile has a clear plastic top that fits snugly against a panoramic windshield to give the driver true 360-degree vision. When it's not in use, the power-operated canopy folds backwards beneath the surface of the trunk deck. Among its advanced engineering features is a radar locating device that scans the highway and warns the driver of objects in its path. The AeroVet concept is an experimental mid-engine coupe. It was developed in 1973 to test high-performance design and engineering concepts that were not planned for production. It featured a steel and aluminum body of birdcage construction with fiberglass skin. The bifold gullwing doors with thick side windows help reduce the body weight. A 400 cubic inch V8 is mounted transversely near the middle of the chassis. More recently, GM created the Corvette Serve 3. This high-tech vehicle featured a prototype carbon fiber body and chassis. Power is supplied by a transversely mounted twin turbocharged LT5 V8. This rocket ship is all-wheel drive with four-wheel steering. In 2002, GM unveiled the autonomy concept. Looking more like a Mars exploration vehicle, it was designed to test advanced engineering technologies related to chassis design and packaging. It also featured a fuel cell powertrain. In 1951, the LeSabre was one of the first show vehicles produced by GM Styling following World War II. Reflecting Harley Earl's fascination with jet fighters, the LeSabre adopted many of the design and engineering features found in high-performance aircraft. Lightweight materials like cast magnesium and aluminum were used in many key areas like the deck lid and the hood. The wraparound windshield was an industry first. The convertible top and side windows are electrically operated and raise automatically when moisture hits a sensitized spot located between the seats. Mike Doty showed me this incredible concept car. Well, now this is probably one of the most beautiful design cars in the fleet, I think. This is the 1951 LeSabre. Not a LeSabre, but the LeSabre. The LeSabre. This was the first car ever done with the name LeSabre on it. It was really Harley Earl's baby, wasn't it? Yes, it really was. Uh, after this vehicle came off the show circuit, Harley Earl actually drove this car personally around the Detroit area, back and forth to work on a daily basis. This car actually has 51,000 miles on it, by far the most of any of our historical fleet as far as a concept oh, that's, car that's goes. That's unheard of for a concept car. 51,000 miles is a lot. Again, very flight influenced. Yeah, this vehicle was designed after actually a French fighter plane. Uh, that Harley had seen and was influenced to design this car after that type of look. It's an aluminum body, right? Yes, with some cast magnesium in this vehicle. Yeah. And the engine? It's an all-aluminum V8. Uh, it's got hemispherical heads, supercharged, two carburetors. In 51? 
1951. Now, it's a really interesting grill up there, and that, that's, that does a yeah. trick. It doubles as the Yeah, headlight. actually, that is also the headlight system, which I'll, I'll show you how this works. It's, it actually rotates 180 degrees, and the two lights will come back on. That's incredible. It really is. It's an early hideaway headlight system. Well, there's a lot of other design cues here that showed up in other cars. I mean, sure. that's Corvette. 53 Corvette cockpit right there. Another one of Harley Earl's uh, famous designs, the 53 Corvette, along with the wraparound windshield that you see on this vehicle. Uh, it's got the front bumpers on it. actually ended up in a, similar to that, to the early 53 Cadillac, right. and along with the rear tail fins. Now, as I understand it, there's, there's fuel cells in this car. Yes, there is. There's fuel cells in each side of this car. Uh, this side has actually got gasoline mm -hmm. in it. That side holds alcohol. And what the alcohol would do is at a certain RPM with this vehicle, if you were stepping into the throttle, would induce into the supercharger and give this vehicle an extra boost Oof. of power. Yeah, yeah, it would take off. Kicking yeah. in the afterburners. Absolutely. And that's sort of what the tail looks like. Yeah, it resembles an afterburner when you apply the brake. It's one big light in the center. And when you step on the brake, it all lights up in red. It kind of looks like an afterburner. Yeah. It's just stunningly beautiful and all original, even with 51,000 miles, that's right? That's right. 51,000 miles on this car. And what you're looking at is a... a unrestored 1951 Motorama car by General Motors. All original paint on this car. This car has never been restored. It's got a few gotchas here and there, but generally this car is in its original form. Don't ever touch it. Well, we try to do preservation and not restoration. It's beautiful. Yes. The Firebird 3 was the third and final gas turbine powered car developed by GM in the 1950s to test the feasibility of turbine engines in everyday use. The Firebird 3 concept was unveiled to the world in New York on October 16, 1959. Everything about this amazing car was space age. From its combination jet fighter rocket ship styling to its joystick driver control and onboard computer technology. In short, the Firebird 3 was the most advanced car on the planet in 1959. And some of the same technology would be used to put a man on the moon 10 years later. Well, Mike, now we're in the realm of true design vehicles, and this has got to be one of the wildest GM ever did. The Nin Firebird 3. 1959 Firebird 3. Yeah, it was, it was uh, real wild on the styling end, big on the fins in the back. Definitely uh, airplane influenced here on this, now, on this vehicle. It was a third in a series though, right? It was a third in a series. GM was toying with the idea of building turbine engines back in the 50s. They had a series of these cars, Firebird 1, 2, and 3, and each one of them uh, served their own specific purpose for their test beds. This was the final of the series in 1959, and this was the one that, um, that GM threw all their greatest technologies into at the time. Well, it's, it's such a wild Flash Gordon Buck Rogers design. It's, it's actually, it's Harley Earl, right? Yeah, this is Harley Earl's, one of his finals that he did before he retired and left uh, GM styling. Uh, you can see a lot of his influence. Harley was very heavily influenced by these, by the airplanes of the time. All of his concept cars, if you were to go back and look, you can see the influences that Harley had. Uh, definitely the fins give, give it all away as being Harley also. He was big into that. But this really was a test platform for possibly looking at turbine engines for passenger cars, right? Yes. Uh, well, turbines were beginning to be the, um, the engine of the future at the time. A lot of military uh, applications were being used, and uh, definitely in the aircraft industry. So the, the automobile industry was taking a look at possibly doing these same type of engines. So they had to build something to, to test these vehicles and see how feasible it was. They did learn that these vehicles... They ran really hot. The car runs about 1,500 degrees. That's hot. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty hot. And it stays hot all day, too. <laughs> and it also, uh, it's, the fuel consumption's really big on this car. It, it drinks a lot of fuel. Well, there's actually two engines in this, though, right? Yeah, there's a gasoline engine in the front of this vehicle. Uh, it's a two-cylinder gasoline engine. And what it does is power all your accessories in this vehicle, your, your alternator, your power steering pump, and your air conditioning. This vehicle is actually an air conditioned cool. vehicle. Uh, the regenerative gas turbine is in the rear of this vehicle, and it does nothing more than power the rear wheels, and that's what gives this car rolling. Well, I love the, the fighter jet canopies. Can you open up the cockpit? Sure. Wow. Yeah, it actually has a gullwing wing type of uh, configuration here, the way it opens, but it allows for maximum accessibility to get into the vehicle. There's no steering wheel? No steering wheel. No gas pedal, no brake pedal in this car. Everything is run by the joystick in the center console. 
uh, it, as you move the joystick left and right, it will turn the wheels. If you push the joystick forward, it'll apply power to the rear wheels. If you pull back on it, it applies the brakes. It's really a different type of thing to get used to. You have to take everything you know as driving a vehicle today and throw it right out the window because you, you don't have a brake pedal to step on or anything else. I bet that's silly. And you can actually drive it from either side, right? You can drive this vehicle from the left side or the right side. Yeah. Probably the kids today would be a lot better with this with the video games. <laughs> uh, the adults might have a little harder time with it. The kids today would probably have no problem driving this vehicle. I believe it. I believe yeah. it. It's wild. Great car. The Buick LaCrosse is an excellent example of the type of concept cars GM is building to get feedback on designs and to test technology they'll be using five or ten years down the road. This five-passenger sedan combines roominess and comfort with an elegant exterior design that immediately says Buick. With its sweep spear side profile, vertical bar grille, portholes, and cross-car rear lighting. So, Mike, this would be an example of the latest, greatest from GM design and, and decidedly Buick. Yes, this, uh, the Buick LaCrosse is definitely a graceful and stylish luxury sedan. It was actually unveiled in 2000 at the Detroit Auto Show. Uh, you see the Buick styling in this futuristic concept vehicle with the portholes mm -hmm. here on the fenders all the way up to the grille that shows some early Buick design. It's got 21 inch wheels on it. Also, it's stylish. It says Buick all the way inside with the wood grain on the dash to the beautiful leather seats inside this vehicle. Well, it's so sleek and just, I mean, it just like would slide through the air and it's got all these, yeah. you know, these trick features like the glass roof and, it and it's got also, it does all sorts of uh, electronic tricks. Yes. It's voice activated, Yeah, right? this is a voice activated car. It's Can something you new we're playing with. Show me something? Sure. Dr what we do is you give the command to the vehicle. We'll say lacrosse, driver's door, open. Oh yeah, pulls back and and Off it will go. open, oh, just, man. just that easy. Very slick, and it's a suicide door car, so actually yes, the back would open and you'd have the, the, the great entrance and yep. other things like the hood, does the hood work? The hood also the same way, lacrosse, open hood. Well, that's cool. Now just like the early Buicks, which you'll notice with this hood as it comes straight up, it will tilt to the side. Oh yeah, it's the, the piano hood, the grand piano hood. That's correct. Underneath the hood of this vehicle, we have the all new 4.2 liter V8. It's dual overhead cam multi-valve, 265 horsepower. Absolutely beautiful. Man, beautiful. I, would, I would love to see one of these on the road someday. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd love to close this up. Can I do this? Sure. How do you do it? Just give it a command. What you would say to this vehicle right now is, lacrosse, go to sleep. Lacrosse, go to sleep. Ooh. And that closes everything. That is so cool. Well, I tell you, you know, John actually let me drive a couple of his, mm -hmm. his cars. You know, we've talked about three very cool design vehicles. Mm -hmm. I love this one, but the Firebird is just too awesome. The Firebird 3, and I understand you're one of the few people on earth that can drive it, is that true? That's, that's true. So can we fire up the Firebird? I think that's a great choice. <laughs> yeah. Let's do it. Let's go for a ride. All right. You're not gonna kill me, right? No, we're gonna okay. go slow. Go ahead. Oh, ooh. Oh, nice fit. Yeah. <laughs> we're gonna dump the fuel into the igniters. We're going to watch our temperatures. They're going to climb up to around 1,200 degrees. She's lit. It's kind of ironic, don't you think? Taking a present day drive in 1959's car of the future? Some of the Firebird 3's engineering and design we take for granted today, but turbine power never really proved feasible. This is a great car to go for a cruise with somebody you really don't want to talk to because, because you really can't hear each other. It's a time for reflection, you know? Good visibility. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Watching someone drive a car without a steering wheel or foot pedals is very strange. The unit control steering stick was designed so that either the driver or the passenger could drive, or not drive. You see, GM was working on a driving system that would take over the controls and auto-guide the car along a low-frequency powered cable that was implanted in the road. I don't know, this cockpit design reminds me of the dome of silence and get smart, you know? Yeah. What? I can't hear you. What? Yeah, I know. And I have to tell you, the sensation of riding in this is more like a space vehicle than a car. 
It's kind of like you're just taxiing everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> If Mike only knew I was going to whack him over the head and seal this thing. And there were even more Firebird innovations, including remote keyless entry, automatic starting to ensure a properly heated car when you got in, two-way radio communications with a central control station or control towers lining the sides of tomorrow's highways, and a lighting system that could detect when it gets dark and automatically turn the headlights on. It is the ride of a lifetime, though, i got to tell you.